I think that when you look online at people that are nailing it in terms of conversion and positioning themselves and, and putting themselves out there, it's because they've figured out how to create personal connections with those people that are in the sphere from behind their computers. This is Insight, scaling lessons from the street. In this series, we mastermind a set of topics plaguing women entrepreneurs on a mighty growth path, such as mindset, business modeling, sales, marketing, finance, and legal. Whether you're looking for world domination or to work less while being more profitable, you'll find learnings in here from women who know the journey and fight in the trenches every day. Inside is co-hosted by Andrea Henry, Megan O'Neill, Sheila Cummins, Susan Diaz, and Wendy Brookhouse. Hi there, my name is Susan Diaz and I'm one of the co-hosts of this podcast. I am Chief Content Strategist of C Plus B Digital, a digital marketing agency focused on using content as a conversion tool for small businesses and beyond. Each week, one of us will moderate a discussion around a topic of growth that is close to our hearts and our bottom lines. This week, I wanna set this off and talk about something that plagues me. It's a discussion that is sort of timely because of the 2020 that we're in right now. Who else can't believe that? 20 years after we talked about Y2K and how the world was going to implode overnight. And it kind of brings to my mind a little discussion around how far have we really come in two decades? How far has the digital transformation that we claim that we're all a big part of really come? What is working for us? What perhaps can we get rid of in a super big hurry? And where can we take it from here? Often I find that people will have this discussion from a negative perspective because you know how the news cycle is, right? People just prefer to talk about the downside of things. And so you're gonna find people who talk about the data issues and the security breaches and how crappy automation is and all of the rest. But there is a massive positive side to this as well. And to me that is taking a look at how much knowledge is opened up over the years, right? Like the fact that we have access to information at the end of our fingertips and that the that's all about being online. We learn online, we shop online, we form relationships online. I often like to talk about how until the end of last year, I hadn't met my largest client or my therapist. And that's kind of the nature of the online world, right? So for how does that sort of slice and dice for small businesses, especially women-owned small businesses for us? On the upside, I think it's opened up a lot of technology solutions. There's so much out there that we can use. There's so much access that we have. But on the downside of it, I don't know that necessarily all of us know how to deploy it and use it. And we just sort of have to take the word of someone else and see what works for us. And, you know, so that's kind of what I wanted to chat about on this episode. I wanted to open um, the discussion to this very powerful group of women here today and ask, what is a, a digital rant and a rave perhaps, right? I mean, what is one way in which technology really has served you in the last maybe decade or even longer and what is one way in which you're like I can't believe I'm still fighting with this problem uh, we're going to start with Wendy Brookhouse Wendy talk to me well Susan I find digital fascinating and I spend a lot of time actually going to conferences and seeing what's next because I do think there's ways that it can make my job easier and make my clients lives easier and all those things so if I'm out on the forefront trying to figure that out I think my my rant is that in my industry where I deal with um, investment companies and insurance companies and people like that, they are just, and I mean just starting to understand digital and, un and starting to deploy some of the tools that you would think would be so natural for them to do. And so that is my rant is that, hey, get on it, go faster, <laughs> and let's make sure you're solving the right problems with your digital, you know, the things you're so you think you're solving for me is to make sure you're solving the right questions. And my rave, my rave is, is things like um, my CRM tool that can actually manage some of my time and you know, oh, I'm supposed to meet with so-and-so in three months and I can just put it in there so that they automatically get two or three emails inviting them to schedule themselves in as opposed to me having to try and remember and calendar it and all that type of stuff. I can make things so much easier from a process standpoint and in a way that I'm not relying on people to remember stuff. So uh, that's my rave. Um, I'm in love with that kind of stuff. All right, Megan, Megan O'Neill, Mindset Business Strategist. Um, this is always an interesting perspective. Talk to us from a mindset perspective. Well, I mean, it's certainly 
in terms of working with people. So I was a traditional one-on-one -on -one in the office. I had my office. I met with people in my office. And that, that caused me a lot of stress once I had kids and in terms of travel. And so it offered me the opportunity, the digital world, to work at home, to work with people all around the world. And I, I absolutely love that, that part of it. Um, the, there's so many flips to everything I'm going to say, but the flip side is, is that I'm a connector. I love to connect to people. I love to be with people in, um, in person. And I find that I've disconnected since I went online. So I'm not, I, I can get stuck in my house. I mean, there's always something in terms of what you can do. The other side of it is, is that it opened up my world as, as a businesswoman and as an entrepreneur, I didn't have any mentors and I didn't have any colleagues. I didn't, have, because I'm, I'm in an unusual field and I was when I first started, I didn't even understand, for example, uh, Sheila will appreciate the business coaches. I didn't even understand there was business coaches for women like me. I saw them as business, male business coaches. That's what I would have thought, the old traditional sort of definition of it. And I didn't understand. I was so lonely in the old days. Like I always tell people who are starting out, like when I started, because I work one-on-one -on -one with people, I didn't have any colleagues. I didn't even have an office really. I just had my, my own little office. So it's totally changed the nature of my business where I can go online and learn from someone in Australia or someone in Europe or someone in Toronto because I'm in Ottawa. The other side of it though, and I love, I love the social media platforms. I'm really excited to, I've pretty well met all of you, I think that way. But on the other, the other hand, I'm not great or I have to learn how to disconnect more. That's, that's what I find that is the challenge for me. And so my mind gets tired quickly. So I love, as much as I don't understand it, I really love technology. It's made a huge difference in my business. And generally, I, I was reading an article recently that was talking about women in the law. So women graduate from law school at about the same rate as men. And then if you look five, seven years um, into the profession, the number of women plummet. And that's because traditionally the practice of law has been kind of incompatible with having a family because it's long hours, you're away from family for a long time. And so technology has really allowed women in law to continue to practice, but on our own terms, because it allows you to work from home, because it allows you to work flexibly. And the new subscription services allow you when you're starting off and you don't have a lot of money available, they allow you to get access to the same type of practice management programs and client relationship management tools that previously you would have needed to come up with a chunk of change to get someone to design that for you. So it's really allowed for a lot of flexibility, I think, um, particularly for women in the legal profession. A rant would be sort of similar to what Wendy was saying in terms of, I don't think the industry has really caught up with all of the, the various things that we can do with technology and some of the rules and regulations are kind of stuck 20 years in the past and aren't really reflective of how clients want to do business, right? Because it's not just a matter of, I love technology because it helps me work how I want to work, but it's also clients, right? People are busy. People don't necessarily want to have to drive an hour to see you and then look for parking and <laughs> go through traffic because we're busy people. So I think some of the more traditional professions could be more welcoming of technology and, and could understand that this is how the world is, that we're moving towards a more digital age, we're moving towards you know, focus on intellectual property and digital connections, and reflect that in their, their governance of the, of the professions. You know, I, I got to just echo what Wendy and Megan and Andrea and what you said, Susan, you know, de digital technology has opened up a world of opportunity. And in my practice, I focus solely on women entrepreneurs. And what I've seen over the last decade is the ease with which someone can start a business now is tenfold what it used to be. And, you know, Megan, you saying, well, you know, I, had, I was in my office all the time and it was boring. That's not how it's done now. And I'm going to date myself, but I remember when Facebook book came out and I was one of those people who had to take my parents computer to go put a modem in it because there was this thing called the internet and then you could start emailing so that's just dating myself a bit but what it, I, I've seen the evolution it's been amazing to live the evolution and it is a rave because the opportunity that's sitting in front of us is is 
unlimited. It opens every door, it removes every boundary, it removes geography from the equation, it gives us access to people that we wouldn't normally have. And I think that's amazing. And to use Megan's word on the flip side, we are living in a world that is completely disconnected, where the rates of depression are skyrocketing, where people have never felt more lonely and are self, self-soothing through very harmful practices of alcoholism, drug use, um, medicating, you know, shopping, whatever their modality is to help them feel better. That is a little bit of my rant is in my industry anyway, in the, in the coaching world, the business development world, there's a big shift away from people into more of a digitized experience. But what I actually think is we need more in-person experiences. I think it's a great platform, but I think as entrepreneurs, one of our goals is to build those personal relationships with people who we need. And I think that when you look online at people that are nailing it in terms of conversion and positioning themselves and and putting themselves out there, it's because they figured out how to create personal connections with those people that are in the sphere from behind their computers. And so, you know, as much as the the industry has been such a boost and, and access for women to be able to start gigs that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do, I think we also need to parallel it and, and come back to we are all in the business of people and we all need to have opportunities where we can connect with other people eyeball to eyeball because I think it's a bit of a lost art. My second rant is all of these digital platforms, which are amazing. There's so many. They can help you solve any problem within your business. The problem is they always say that it's so easy to use that even, you know, my 10-year-old could do it or even so-and-so could do it or look, I built my own website or I could do Well, I'm a pretty smart lady. And I cannot, for the life of me, figure out 90% of these softwares. There's nothing easy about it. And so at the end of the day, I still end up paying someone to set them up. So that is a little bit of a rant as well. I think we're all making such great points over here in terms of, we've discussed it on a number of occasions, each of us separately. It all, to my mind, sort of comes back to that idea of being proactive. Like the opportunity in front of us is to take this giant open space that is technology and see where we can apply it to our businesses and our lives and so much beyond, right? Like it goes into, I'm constantly raving about apps that help you grocery shop online and apps that help you, you know, sort of like improve your quality of life in itself. And I think to my mind, it sort of comes down to the fact that you're going to have to learn user behavior in order to leverage this better, right? Like you want better automation. And if I know how to do automation, it's only because I keep asking again and again the question, can we put this button over here? Can this do this? Can this go back instead of the person having to reload the page? And that I think think is going into the consumer's mind and sort of understanding a little bit how they apply technology and use it. And to your point about tech support being so hard on most of these apps, it comes back to that. They don't understand what to do when things break down. And my hope is that, you know, that's where the improvement will come. Understand how people use that tech and try to make it work for us. I love that. To your point, you figuring out how to do it, that's because that's what your clients need from you. And, you know, I'm thinking about Andrea with her law firm, Megan with her coaching practice, Wendy with her financial uh, consultancy. They, They don't need to know how to do that, but I think there's so many times I've just had to give up and hire out. And so as much as it's a problem solving, it also needs to have a budget attached to it because I don't have hours to figure out how to upload my image because it's not the right size. Then I have to resize my image. Well, then I can't do it in this platform because you have to have the pro account, but then I got to, I don't want to have the pro account. So then I got to down, you know, download a new software, but then that puts a virus on my computer and then I'm two days out and I still don't Mm -hmm. have a damn image to use. So that is sort of the cycle that I see. (laughs) <laughs> I'm happy to chat about the importance of staying in your own lane. And, and the thing is, when you're now starting out, it is difficult, right? If you're starting out and you don't have a huge budget, like you either spend time or you spend money. So when you're starting out, you might not have a ton of clients or there's not a lot that you're doing. You have the time to spend two, three days figuring out. But as soon as you start to have some momentum, I think we really need to let go of the idea that you know, that we have to do everything ourselves, that we have to be good at everything, recognizing what it is that needs to be done, recognize who is the most talented person who can do it for you, 
you know, within your budget and then delegate because, and I'll, we'll talk about it later, but you know, one of the things is as women entrepreneurs is, and I've seen this with clients, I've seen this in my own business, trying to hold on to everything. And so if we accept technology as a tool and understand that it can be a tool in our business, but it doesn't need to be a tool that's wielded by us necessarily. I'll chime in on that, Andrea. I think a lot of my role in running the company is to understand the power of the technology and know what it can do and what I want it to do. And then I want others to make it so. So I like exactly. to be at the 30,000 foot view and beyond that, man, oh man, don't ask me a single question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Wendy, can you talk a little bit about affording it that we can continue with that point of specialists? Oh, I think it, it's an easy thing. I mean, we've all heard this number, but if you think about how much your time is worth, right? And let's even just go simple as bookkeeping or, well, I, you know, social media, whatever it is, uh, chances are someone else can do it better and faster than you can. It's their unique ability, whereas your unique ability is going to do stuff that earns you $100, $200 an hour, whatever that number is. So you should focus on that so that if you're paying someone $50 an hour to do a task, you know, they're going to do a whole bunch more than you would have in, in that one hour. And you're still, you should be further ahead if you've got the momentum as Andrea talked about. One of the things that I have finally given up control over is getting the software sequences to happen. And so if somebody, you know, opts in for this thing, you know, whatever the download is or the tool that's available or the class they're registering for, you know, to have it then trigger this whole email sequence, it sounds so straightforward. And I can map it out on my whiteboard beautifully, but to get A to talk to B and then to get the right links in the email and then to make sure that it's deliverable with the right people in the right pages, that's beyond me. I cannot tell you enough how everybody is nodding right now. <laughs> like Sheila, I have had to learn the hard way. I've made an awful lot of errors and, and probably lost some money for sure doing, um, trying to do things on my own. Although I'll give myself credit. I knew my limitations. I know my impatience. But what was interesting, I was at a, um, an angel investor for software, a lot of software people in Ottawa, because Ottawa, you know, at one point was considered to be the Silicon Valley. And the, there was a lot of pioneer women in the tech industry there. And I think that they said that software generally was designed by men for men. So, you know, I thought, well, that's probably very true. Maybe that's part of the reason why I'm so challenged in this area. So I guess as we start to get women who are designing more, ho hopefully, I mean, this is what we, we hope the future will be, it will be more intuitive for us and that it won't be such a frustration. But I, I mean, I, I think a lot of women are also really intimidated. I have uh, women who are older who are starting into their second careers and they are very intimidated by technology. And that's, of course, the first thing I say to them, this is what you need to, just don't even bother. Um, where's your genius line? It's not that. All right, so to end this off and give people some tips in terms of the tools that really work for us, some of the, these might be obvious, but they're key elements of establishing that really strong virtual office as a small business. So we're going to share our favorite tools. Ishila, pick your favorite tool, boys and girls. I think one of the things that saves my bacon is the social media auto schedulers. There's quite a few that are out there, you know, a, a Hootsuite, a later.com, meet Edgar, like there's a million and different ones to use, but you know, to be putting out social each and every day is really time consuming. And so if you can batch create your content and then batch schedule it so that it goes out, it allows you to then just be present on the platforms and not have to do anything uh, beyond that. That's a really great one. Wendy, do you have one that you like to use more than others? Well, I, I have a whole bunch of them that I like to use, but the one I just started playing with now is Loom, L-O-O-M. And what it allows me to do is to do follow-up meetings. And if I'm sending off particularly complex documents, I can actually film myself going through the documents with the client so that uh, I record the video, I hit stop, I send them a link, I can see if they've watched it. Um, so it's a great way to get into that follow-up video way with uh, just the key points I want them to take away. And Andrea? So first of all, I'm making a note of Loom because that is wonderful. If you can record. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's going to solve so many problems. Okay, so maybe that will be my favorite one. But for now, I love client relationship management systems. The one that I use in particular is for lawyers. It's Clio, um, Clio Grow, out of a company out of BC. But just the concept of being able in a in a business which is so relationship focused, you really have to know who are your clients, where are they in the cycle. Um, I depend heavily on past clients and referral partners to refer new business. And so making sure that you're staying in touch with everyone, that you're providing value throughout the year. Um, you know, if you've got a slower sales cycle that you know where people are, when something might be more important, just being able to have all of that at your fingertips and automated is amazing and has really changed my practice. Yay to the intelligent CRM system. Yeah. Megan, do you have a favorite tool? Yeah, the one that we're using, Zoom. I love Zoom. It completely changed how I connect with people, how I work with people. And I particularly like the fact that I can work with people across the globe. And I do. And some of my old clients who have moved out of the country and then they'll turn their monitor around. One woman was in Africa and she showed me her scene in Nairobi. <laughs> I just thought that is the coolest thing. True globalization. Uh, and my favorite tool, I know I should have a cooler one than this one, but um, my favorite tool is really to do with sharing and being able to integrate in, in a digital office. And it has to be Google. I know that a lot of the larger organizations don't really lean into Google as hard, but they already own the world. So we might as well figure out how to use them well. So using Google Docs and Sheets and real proper um, cloud storage has made a big difference in our business and many others of our size um, who need to be integrating with a lot of external uh, partners. So that would be the tool. You're paying for the email anyway, and there's a lot more firepower that's under the Google engine beyond the emails that we pay for. So that right there, I think, gives you a little cross-section of the type of tools that make our virtual offices run. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to Insight. If you enjoyed listening, do us a solid and leave us a review. It helps keep us motivated to put our time into producing episodes of value. Thank you.